fellow herpers and fellow leopard gecko lovers. John Hogston here again with another video for you. Um, it's been a couple weeks. It's been a busy couple weeks, so it's you know been a, been a little slow on the content department, uh, but things are about to ramp up here in pretty short order. Um, today I thought I would do the incubator build video that I've been promising for the last two or three weeks. Um, I just finally got one of the last parts that I needed to get into the uh, incubator and uh, to make it work the way I want it to. And right now I'm testing it, and I'll talk about that a little more at the end. But I'm really encouraged because it seems to be holding temperature beautifully uh, with not much deviation from the actual heat tape temperature. So that's awesome. So I hope you guys are doing well. Um, I hope you've had a good couple of weeks. I hope your projects are going well if you have any projects. Um, thank you for everybody that's posted comments, um, especially Frank. Thank you, uh, Denise. Um, it really it really is helpful if, um, if you like the content to like, subscribe, comment. Um, YouTube's very picky about, you know, channels they – they put out. Uh, so you kind of have to tick all the boxes. You have to have people interacting with it. You have to have people subscribing, getting notifications, yada, yada, yada. So if you feel so inclined, you'd like the content, by all means, I would appreciate it. So that being said, happy Sunday. And uh, let's get, let's get this ball rolling here. <clears throat> Sorry, good. Just ate a candy bar and a little verklempt. <clears throat> so I'm going to go through some pictures here and kind of explain the process that I went through to build this incubator. I've built dozens of incubators, and each time I seem to find something a little bit different that I like better than the last time or a product that's a little bit better than I liked the last time. Um, I wasn't too picky in the past about you know what kind of um, – you know, beverage cooler, wine cooler, fridge, whatever that I used uh, to build these incubators. But I was a little more um, specific this time. I had something in my head um, that I wanted, I didn't want to deviate from. I wanted flat shelves. So I went out and looked around on Facebook Marketplace, and I, there's this place locally here that sells new and used appliances and that kind of stuff. And um uh, Occasionally seems to get some pretty good deals, so I uh, went in there. Um, well, first of all, the only reason I went in there is because all the other ones that were used on, like, Facebook Marketplace and uh, Craigslist, that kind of stuff, people wanted way too much money for them. They were totally in love with whatever it was they were selling. So these guys always, like I said, seem to have reasonable prices. So I ended up – hold on, let me move this over here. There we go going down there and um, I purchased this mini fridge, wine cooler, beverage cooler. I think it's actually a beverage cooler. Um, got it for like 80 bucks. So that's another thing. I In these videos, when I do these builds and that kind of stuff and, you know, like with the rack, the incubator, I'm doing it with the common person in mind. You know, somebody doesn't have a lot of money or, you know, maybe doesn't have a lot of time, just has – Regular resources like most of the population does, like me, me included. So I bought this for 80 bucks, brand new. The only reason I got it for 80 bucks instead of like 150 or 200 bucks is the glass door on the front. Uh, let's see if I have a different picture here. There we go. The glass door on the front. It's hard to see from this picture, but it's it's a double pane door. So there's a pane of glass on the outside and a pane of glass on the inside. The pane of glass on the outside was broken, and they removed it. So it only has this one pane of glass. You can kind of see where the rubber gasket was on this on the outside here. But for my purposes, to keep something around 85 degrees-ish, this is perfect. I don't need it to be like to hold subarctic temperatures or super hot temperatures or whatever. 
the seal, the rubber gasket on the inside was is all good. It's brand new, you know, and uh, so I figured I'd take a chance, and you know, you can kind of see that there's a nice, nice new seal around there. Um, but again, the reason I wanted this kind, because in the past I've I've always kind of cheaped out and got the cheapest thing I could find that had a glass door, and most of the time, if it was a excuse me a wine cooler, it would have those like uh, shelves with the humps, you know, for the for the wine bottles. So you'd have these little humps in the shelves, and you couldn't put anything flat in there. So I'd have to take out those shelves and try to make shelves. And usually I'd make them out of like um, f- like industrial fluorescent lighting, uh, like a g- plastic grid that goes over those. So I'd try to cut those to size and fit those in there, but they wouldn't hold a lot of weight and that kind of stuff. So, so I thought, well, if I'm going to do it, the next one I'm going to do is going to have flat shelves. And so this was the winner because not only was it 80 bucks, it had flat shelves and they were adjustable shelves. I could you know, adjust the height on them. So it was a win-win all the way around. It was kind of a shame because I'm going to, I'm going to, or I was going to try to reuse like the light and some other stuff. Um, but as you'll see, as I go along here, that was not able to be the case. So um, here's the model. Not that I think it's still a current model. It's made by Insignia. It's a 130 can beverage cooler. Um, one thing I will say, if you do buy a beverage cooler, wine cooler, whatever, and you do intend to use the electronics, at least like the light and the fan or whatever, there's some things that you have to keep to keep power to the unit. Like on this unit, it had a front power button like this up in the corner here. There's a power button here. I did not know that it needed a few components to to use this panel. Like this panel was wired in a way that I couldn't disconnect certain things. Like the whole thing had to be powered up in order to be able to use the light and the fan. And I didn't want that because, you know, even though I disconnected the compressor and got rid of the compressor and that kind of stuff, um, it just, I couldn't seem to get it to work. But anyway, talk about that in a minute. But if you do and you do and you're handy and you want to kind of understand how things are wired, Generally in the back, there's like a wiring diagram. This is the circuit board for this one. And I only wanted the fan, which was down here in the LED, um, which was, the, I believe, the light. So I had the, I had the compressor disconnected and removed and some other things. So anyway, long story short, I ended up using the fan, but I had to wire it, hardwire it myself. So... So when I bought that, I had purchased some heat tape, some 12-inch heat tape uh, from Reptile Basics uh, because I three, four-inch, six-inch heat tape is not going to be enough. You need 12-inch, especially if with a cooler, even though it's not a big cooler, to be efficient, especially if you're not using like a, a Vivarium Electronics thermostat, which I'm not on this one. Um, I want it to be able to um, radiate enough heat without using a lot of power. So 12 inch is the way to go. And that's the way I went. Uh, I bought it so that I would have to wire it myself. So I bought the tape separately and the, you know, the wire and plug separately uh, because I, you would have to drill a hole really wide hole. If you're going to, if you were going to get this pre-wired, you'd have to dr- drill a really big hole to be able to get that plug end to fit through it. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to try to keep everything sealed as best as I could. Uh, so, you know, maybe a three quarter inch hole that allowed all the cords and stuff I needed to go through. And, um, I've wired enough heat tape that it not a big deal. So, and I'll explain if you don't know, explain the process of that. I had laying around, I had an extra case fan because I, I built computers and stuff too, um, or at least I used to. So I have a lot of little computer components laying around. I got this 12-volt adapter here. So if you're not going to use the supplied fan in these beverage coolers, which is what I wanted to do, but I couldn't, you have to have this like 12-volt um 
adapter to be able to run a fan, a 12 volt fan inside that. Um, so I didn't end up using this fan because the fan that was in there already was a 12 volt fan that was almost just like this computer case fan. So I, there's no point in even using this. So it'll go on another incubator. I'm sure I'll need another incubator down the road. And I had this Zilla thermostat. Um, I think it's, I think I paid 40 ish, 45 bucks, whatever it was for this about a year or so ago. And, you know, it's not like a vivarium electronics, you know, that gives a steady, like a, the pulse proportional signal. Um, it basically, so if I, if I have the temperature set at 95, it'll turn on and get, go up to until the probe reads 95. Sometimes it'll hit 96, 97 real cause it heats up quickly and then it'll shut off and then it'll drop to like 94 and then it'll click on. So it's constantly turning on, off, on, off, on, off. So the temperature or the power fluctuates, um, you know, for what it is, I mean, it's a good thermostat so far. It seems like it's working pretty good. Um, it's, you know, it's, you, typical, you've got your set button up and down Fahrenheit Celsius. Uh, you've got the plug here to plug in the heat tape. You've got the probe here, and it actually had a really surprisingly long lead on it, which was good. I didn't need it, but it's nice. Uh, nice long cord. So I figured, ah, I'll just use this and uh, go from there. Okay, so the first thing I did, and I don't think I have a picture of it here. I have a pic, sort of a picture of the back here. I did remove the compressor and everything. Um, you just want to be careful and make sure that, depending on what kind of coolant is in there, um, you're wearing gloves and a mask or whatever. And, and sometimes, and I'm not condoning doing this because obviously some coolants are not allowed to be released into the atmosphere. But this particular one, I looked it up. If you look at the the tag on the back, it says that it has. Um, where is it here? Refrigerant is, refrigerant is R600A. And I looked it up online, and it is able to be vented, I guess, when you cut the line or whatever. So it's not it doesn't affect anything. Uh, and there wasn't much in there. Literally, when I cut the line, it's just like a little, little hiss, and that was it. So it must have been missing or leaking coolant or something. The thing that it did have a lot of was the lubricating oil. So just be aware of that when you cut the lines and stuff and you turn it on its side or move it, there is lubricating oil in there that will run out. And it looks, um, well, just like put a piece of cardboard down or something. So I removed all that and I disconnected it and then removed it because of the weight. It you know, probably weighed a good 10 pounds or so. And I just wanted to lighten this thing up because I was moving it a lot. This is the circuit board, the brain box, the whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, I, I had some pictures of it open, but I can't find them on my phone. So you would, if this were open, you'd see there was like plastic connectors connecting all the components. And um, so I ended up disconnecting the compressor um, ground wired and thinking I could just re you know use what was in here for the light and stuff like that. But I ended up not doing it. So I just closed it up, sealed it up, and then I took the power cord and just stuffed it underneath there and secured it. So that was the first thing I did was get, took took out some of the weight. I also took out um as you'll see here in a second, I took out um the the evaporator panel or whatever it's called along in the back like when you open it up and are looking at the back. So like, uh, let's see if I have a picture of that here. Ooh, I thought I did. Anyway, I maybe you can see it in this picture. Yeah, you can kind of see it in this picture. 
this black panel here that it goes from under the fan all the way to the bottom here or to the ledge. There's like a little a lip that and then it goes down to the bottom. So there's basically like four screws that hold this in, and then there's a um like a copper pipe or some kind of pipe that really small diameter, maybe a quarter of an inch, whatever that connected to the compressor underneath it. So when I cut it, it freed up that pipe. So when I took this out, I was able to just pull it out and pull the pipe out. There's like a little hole drilled through the bottom of a rubber gasket and it was easy, pretty easy to just pull it straight out. So did that, cleaned it up a little bit, you know, with a, damp cloth just to get some of the dust and stuff out of it. Uh, so then I just, if, if you ever have a, something that uses like coolant, you know, whether it's a fridge or a cooler, a wine cooler, beverage cooler, the worst place to drill a hole is in the back, uh, because there, there could still be, um, condenser lines or um, like uh, evaporator lines or whatever in the back itself behind that panel. Cause I've run into that before I've drilled through a couple of those. Um, so I've learned in, especially in some of these like wine coolery kind of things, the safest place to drill in a lot of them is like on the top here uh, kind of towards the corner uh, and Almost anywhere on the side where there's no light or no thermostat or whatever, because uh, it's basically just like a like a thin aluminum panel with uh, foam f- um, insulation, and then another whatever the interior is made out of plastic or aluminum, whatever it happens to be. So I I drilled a good size, like I said, probably about three quarters of an inch hole all the way through. And then I kind of moved the drill bit on the, as I was drilling on the inside. So it made a little wider hole on the inside. And I'll show you that in a second, just so the cords had a little bit of space to move one direction or the other, and they weren't like tight against the hole. Uh, These scratches here, I I took a a metal file because what you want to do is you want to make sure that if, especially if the outside is aluminum, You don't want any jagged edges, anything sharp, because when you're pulling cords through there, you don't want to cut through those cords or expose the wires in the cords. So I just took a a flat file and just kind of went over the top of this to make sure it was flush and there was nothing sharp sticking out. Then I have a a round rasp or um, tubular rounded rasp, whatever you want to call it, that I went into the hole with around the edges of it just to, you know, make sure that there was nothing jagged sticking out. And uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one that's paranoid about electrical fires and that kind of stuff. So I go a little, the extra mile to make sure that it's done right, especially on a home build like this. So you can see this is where the back panel was. And you can see like before I cleaned it, when I drilled the hole on the left-hand side over here, this is all just little foam particles from when I drilled the hole. Um, you know how foam gets like that. It gets all staticky and everything, so when it just sticks to everything. So I had to clean that out a little bit later. But you can see two two of the uh, mounts um, mounts where the screws were for that condenser or whatever that uh, evaporator panel, whatever that is called. Sorry, I'm not a plumber or, or whatever uh, or appliance guy. Um, but behind that, there was a thick white wire and a little, just a little empty pocket there in the, in the insulation. And since I wasn't going to plug this in directly into, you know, the outlet, I wasn't too concerned about this. So I just cut it back and then tape, put electrical tape over it and just put it in this panel back here. Uh, I'm pretty sure this was a uh, temperature, like a, a temperature probe, a thermostat probe, whatever, because it was attached to the back of that evaporator panel. So so when you're building these, you just want to clean stuff up like this. So like this opening here, when I put this in here, uh, this the heat tape actually sits in front of this. So I didn't bother using any foam. I was going to use some of that, you know, the good stuff you can buy 
like at Home Depot in the orange can. Um, but the heat tape was sitting in front of it, and this wasn't a real deep pocket, and it didn't go outside of the unit, so I wasn't worried about any heat loss or anything like that. Um, so I just stuffed this wire back in that little panel there. You can kind of see right here, this is where that um, copper tube was sticking through at the bottom of the condenser panel that I had cut from underneath, and it kind of pulled through nice and easy. There's a little drain over here. Um, I ended up not filling it because warm air rises, and I'm not concerned about heat loss out that little tiny little hole. So, and here's the fan. It was mounted to the top, um, but I eventually ended up I ended up taking the screws out and pulling it out, cutting the wires, remounting it or reattaching the wires, and then remounting it with that 12 volt adapter. Uh, this is the left side when you're facing. This is where I drilled the it like that round hole in the outside. This is what it looks like on the inside. You can see where I kind of moved the bit to make this like little channel. So if I needed to pull a wire this way and a wire this way or whatever, there wasn't like I wasn't like pulling right against a small hole. Um, and I eventually, after the wires were already run, and you'll see this in another picture, I ended up covering this from the outside and the inside. So there was just very little, very little opportunity for heat to escape from this spot. Um, but very, you know, a lot of this prep work, if you just get it all done and knock it out, it makes everything else so much easier. Um, this is where that probe wire was. Like I said, I just used some electrical tape on it and uh, dropped it right folded it and put it back into this pocket here. Uh, better look at the fan. You can kind of see one of the screws there. Very simple setup. Just a screw here, a screw on this side, and then behind it there's like a little plastic clip uh, with the head the wires running through the um, the roof of the unit, the top of the unit. And if you were to look behind this piece of plastic here, you would see that same identical fan that I had, um, it looked just like this. So why not reuse it, which I did. So stuffing the wire back into the pocket, you can kind of see that there, you know, just, just so it was out of the way. And like I said, it's not going to affect anything because it's not plugged into anything. And actually, I don't think it was powered to begin with because I'm pretty sure it was a uh, temperature probe. So this is the f the first wire that I ran in was the the plug wire for the heat tape. And I just wanted to make sure I had enough clearance to put some other wires in there. So before I continued on, did a little test fitting. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so what I did is I, I pulled this wire in so that it had, I had a bunch of slack inside here because I knew when I put the heat tape in here and I assembled the and attached the leads to the heat tape, I had plenty of room and I wasn't pulling on the heat tape at all. And, uh, and there was plenty of slack, so it was not a big deal. Um, and with heat tape, there's really not a hot positive and negative, so it's just it doesn't matter what, what side goes on what. So as you can see, like I said, I had enough wire that I could actually pull it out the front and work on wiring the heat tape. Um, and when you wire heat tape, especially this particular type of heat tape, you can use a um, like a hole punch like you would have for school, um, just so it's, it's strong enough to poke through plastic and maybe a little bit of copper. I use one that we had in our office here and it, it seemed to work just fine. When you, when you go to puncture the hole at the end of the heat tape, you, because you puncture it on the, the copper part here, right at the end on both sides, 
you want to make sure that hole is not too far up because the way these uh, wires are here, um, see like where this, the end of the uh, connector is here, it's raised. So if this hole is too far up, like if you puncture a hole that's too far up, this will catch on the end of the heat tape and it will not allow this hole to line up with the hole that you punched. So you want to make sure that this hole is like within a, like a quarter inch or so of the edge of the heat tape. So this will slide in without this catching or blocking the wave, you know, kind of thing. So, so you, you put the holes in and you, you basically, you take one lead and the kit comes with like this little like rivet kit sort of. So you take the, there's a tall, taller round end and there's a shorter one. So you, the taller one, you just pop it through the bottom and then the shorter one, you just sit it over the top and then you take um, some crimpers. They have to be some pretty heavy duty crimpers. I used a um, vice grip. I have a big vice grip and, um, and you just crush it down until it's flat just so that lead doesn't move. Like if you pull on it or do, you know, move it side to side, it, it stays where it's at. It doesn't move, you know, one way or the other. And the important thing on this type of heat tape is since that element is sandwiched in the plastic, you want to make sure that that lead, that flat part of the lead, you slide it in between the, the two sandwich pieces, the two plastic pieces. Um, like you don't connect it, you don't crimp it with it on top or the bottom. It has to like slide right in. Just follow the instructions that they send you. It, it's very, very, very easy. And there's a ton of videos out there of people doing it. Uh, but their instructions are very, very, uh, very good. Very easy to follow. It's hard to mess it up. So, what I did first is I took some of my aluminum tape that I was going to be using for the heat tape and I cut up about eight pieces of uh, what I call helper pieces. So when I start to get to fit the heat tape, I, I have these small pieces that I can just stick real quick to hold it in place as I'm moving down. So the way I do it is I start at the top. So I've got the heat tape up about where I want it to be there. And then I take one piece on the right side and one piece on the left side. And, and it's important to make sure the heat tape starts straight because as you go down, if it's not straight at the top, it'll like veer off to one side or the other, and then it'll just, it'll screw everything up and you'll have to start all over. I've learned that over the years. So I spend a lot of time making sure the top is straight before I even continue. So I, you know, I piece on each side Oh, one thing about the heat tape I wanted to mention, this is extremely important, extremely important. These little gray pieces here, these are insulators. They're like rubber, but they're sticky. Um, these go over the copper and over the lead. Um, it folds from one side to the other, so you don't make contact, so you don't ever touch it, so you don't electrocute yourself. And then there's two pieces that go on the other end, the very end of the heat tape, too. And you'll see that here in a second. So, you know, I just took these two little helper pieces, you know, to hold it in place while I'm, you know, while I line it up. And then I start smoothing it out with my hand, you know, going down a little bit at a time. So, like, the next piece I, or helper pieces I use, you know, smooth this out till we get to this ledge here. So I put a couple pieces here and the thing to remember is this doesn't have to be perfectly flat like it would be in a rack because you're not sliding tubs over it. You're not, you're not having to worry about tubs catching on the end of it and tearing it uh, or pulling it up. So it doesn't have to be super flat. This one happened to work out that it was super flat. But So I put a couple of these more of these helper pieces down here to keep this top section nice and straight and flat. And then down here where this ledge is like a six inch little ledge and then it drops down to the very bottom of the unit here. The important thing is if you have a ledge like that is don't bend the heat tape. Just, you know, just gently push it over 
uh, and let it conform to it, but don't make it like a 90 degree angle. Don't bend the copper, you know, um, you never want to bend heat tape at all. You can kind of see here. Um, I've already got the other helper pieces in, and then once I did that, I put in larger pieces of uh, the aluminum foil tape to kind of clean up the look and to help keep it flat. So you can see where this ledge is here. It's hard to see here, but it's round. I left see I. You can kind of see where I left the heat tape rounded. It's not like a 90 degree angle, so it's not forced. Same with this curve right, you know, here. It's a nice and you know, nice and flowing kind of curve. Same with the bottom here. You can kind of see it just nice and nice and curvy. So important. Two things important with heat tape. Don't bend it. And Put these insulators, these are the ones that go on the ends, not the ones where the connectors are, but they're the, it's the same material. So you don't, because you never want to contact these yourself, this copper at the end of the heat tape. You make sure that this is on there. It has to be on there. Uh, or you're going to have a bad day really quick if you touch it. Uh, I'm not going to say it's going to kill you, but you're going to have a bad day. I just, from experience, trust me, you're going to have a bad day. Um, so there's you can, there's a couple, and I think you may see it in a, another picture here. The the connectors, the wire that you know the the plug wire that's connected to the heat tape. I wanted to make sure that it was secured on the right side. So there's a piece of uh, aluminum tape up here, and a piece on this side. That way, it just it doesn't get accidentally jolted or pulled or anything like that. Um, so it has some security or rigid rigidness to it. I also did it with uh, the probe and the other stuff too, and you'll see that here in a second. Uh, here's a better look at that. So you can see this is the one side. It goes behind here and then goes out here. So it's just a piece of aluminum tape. Uh, this one comes up and meets this one up in the middle there somewhere, somewhere back here. Uh, but the end, just kind of holding that in place. Uh, and then the, the actual plug wire itself, besides where it's split, I also have that taped to the back. So I've got three spots where this, this cord is secure. So it's not going to get, I don't have to worry about it getting messed up. And I like things out of the way. I don't like anything hanging or, you know, that kind of stuff. Because I've seen some incubators where people just have wires hanging everywhere. Even though there's no moving parts or anything like that, I think it just looks, I don't know, looks stupid to me. But that's just me. Um, this is the bottom. And this is just a picture to show the, the, the um, insulators on the end. And this is the... F the front edge edge of the cooler here, and I I made it I cut the heat tape, just so it was about a quarter of an inch or half an inch away from the edge of that. Um, so there's there's plenty of surface area of this heat tape for this small cooler to keep it warm and keep it at 85 degrees or whatever I end up, you know, whether it's a mixture of males females or just males females whatever. Um, Depends on what this fan does because I have it running now and I'm testing it. It seems like because of the fan, because the fan draws the air, it doesn't blow the air, it draws the air against the back wall so it runs down the back wall kind of and then you know does that kind of thing. Seems like the top shelf is like a degree or so cooler than the other two shelves. I have probes in the top shelf, the middle shelf, and the bottom shelf. The bottom shelf and the middle shelf kind of are – very similar temperature wise or holding temperature similarly. Um, but the top seems a little bit cooler. So I'm going to let it go for like a day or so just to, to let the temperature even out and uh, that kind of stuff to see, um, you know, from opening the door or whatever, if you know, what kind of temperatures I get and what, what range of temperatures from like the thermostat, what it reads and what the actual probes, probe reads inside the egg boxes uh, because I have separate thermometers for those. And that's another thing here. I'm going to sh show you this real quick. Um, this right here, this is the probe 
for the thermostat. Uh, you can see I have it taped in a couple spots here um, and then run out the side. I'm going to say this very clearly because I've seen videos from people that have big channels. Oh, at least one person has a big channel. Uh, not you, Frank. Sorry. Um, and they say specifically in their video to put this probe for the thermostat in the egg box. That is a huge no-no. This heat tape is only designed to be operated no more than 105 degrees. So if it gets above 105 degrees, it'll burn it up. And you're, you're taking a chance of starting a fire. Uh, but it will for sure screw up the heat tape. You'll, you'll destroy it. You'll have to replace it. You have to have the probe on the heat tape itself. So the temperature you're monitoring on the thermostat is the temperature of the heat tape. Like right now I have, experimenting with it, I have mine set at 90, and the temperatures inside seem to be holding at like 86, 87 degrees, which is good. But if you had a weird setup and you had that probe inside one of the egg boxes and you were having a hard time keeping it 85 or like if you were breeding ball pythons or something else that maybe required a little warmer temperatures or something, and you were having a hard time keeping it at 85. Um, and if I, I guarantee if you were to measure the heat tape, it would be hot, like way, way too hot. Um, but you have a chance to burn up the heat tape if you're monitoring the temperature that way. So what, what you're supposed to do is have the probe on the heat tape. And you can see I have it at an angle here. This probe crosses like uh, one, two, maybe three elements here. These brown or black lines here. These are the heating elements. So you want this to cover at least two elements. Um, and, and so it gets an accurate temperature reading because that's where the heat's coming from are these elements. So if you have this probe and it's over here, you're not going to get anything on the copper and you're not going to get anything or at least not a lot or the accurate temperature. If you're on the, if you have it turned sideways and it's on this gray, your opaque area, it's got to be sitting at an angle across a couple of these elements. And it has to be on the heat tape. Cannot be in the egg box. Do not do that. There's a way to monitor the temperature in the egg box, and it is not with the probe. And I'll show you what I'm talking about here. Okay, so after I got all the cables, most of the cables in that I wanted, so I had the 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 plug wire for the heat tape. Um, and then I have the, um, oh, what is this one? So the plug wire for the heat tape. Hold on a second here. Hold on. Oh, the yeah. And uh, the probe, dummy. Sorry, I have a braid fart. So this rounded, more rounded wire is the probe wire from the thermostat. And then you've got this flatter wire is the the lead uh, for the plug wire for the heat tape. So what I do is I take a wire, a wire tie and I just tie them tight together at this point. After I was satisfied with the amount of slack on the inside or the, you know, where I wanted the wires and the tightness I wanted, I just put that there to know that I don't want the wires pulled in any more than that. And uh, it's just more of a visual thing for me. Um, if I'm working on it, I can see this thing because it's nice and bright and orange. I can see if it's getting pulled into that hole or whatever. Um, so without having cleaned up anything, these wires look like they're all over the place because I haven't tidied them up. It's sitting on my bench in front of the gecko rack. So Everything's plugged in just to see if it works. So eventually this will get all tidied up and, you know, whatever. But I put – when I use this type of thermostat, I always put it towards the front because I don't want to re have to keep reaching towards the back to, to try and see it, to try and control the temperature and that kind of stuff. So so basically the way the wires are routed here, this like I said, the center one is the plug uh, that the heat tape plugs into. So this wire here. 
that is the heat tape. This wire on the right side, that actually goes to the power strip that powers the thermostat. And then the left wire is the actual probe for the thermostat. And that's the thing that gets put on the heat tape, not in the uh, egg box. So, you know, this is what it looks like when it's on. It basically, once it's on, you just basically hit the set button and you set your you set your temperature for the for the pro for the heat tape. So not knowing how insulated or how, excuse me or how um, efficient this beverage cooler is, I started out with um, 95 degrees because I figured well maybe there be there might be a 10 degree temperature difference from what the heat tape is to the inside of the egg box. So I figure if it's 95, I could probably get 85 inside the uh, egg boxes. Well, it turns out that when I had it set at 95, the, the temps were reading like 89, 90 degrees on all three shelves, which is way too hot. Um, so it dropped it down to 90 and it's still reading kind of high right now. Uh, I opened the door to let some heat out because I wanted it to start all over from the beginning. Uh, but I actually have it set to 88 right now because it seems like it's running about three degrees from the heat tape, uh, difference from the heat tape to the inside of the egg box. So what I did to test that, uh, this is just showing one of the, I just used this plastic container that had a hole, an air hole in the side already. And I have these, I bought a, on Amazon a series of three of these cheapy thermometers with these uh, like six foot probes on them or however long, four foot probes. And you want that kind. You don't want the kind that just sits on something. You want one that has the probe. It was like 10 or 11 bucks. It was super cheap for three of them, a package of three of them. And it was perfect because I wanted one for each shelf uh, because I figured the temperature is going to vary a little bit from top shelf to bottom shelf, not a whole lot, but a little bit. And these aren't the most, you know, like scientific, scientifically accurate thermometers, but they're good enough for the purpose of what I'm trying to do here. So on the top shelf, I put this little container in here as if it were like an egg container. And let's say the eggs were suspended, like on a, in a SIM container where they're sitting on a plastic rack uh, with uh, water gel or sponges or whatever uh, underneath. So you want to try to sort of create the same situation you'd have if you had an incubator with egg boxes in it. Um, because, you know, heat, the heat may transfer a little differently if it's full of stuff compared to only having one box in it uh, or two boxes or three boxes. So I, I wanted to try three boxes, one on each shelf, just to get an idea of the temperature gradient between the shelves. So the top box, you know, took this little thermometer, put the probe through the hole, and just let it sit on that little paper substrate there. Um, and then, do, 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 do. Uh, this was actually, I hadn't, it hadn't been the door hadn't been closed for a long time, maybe forty five minutes. But I had the the thermostat at this point set at ninety degrees. And on the top shelf with no fan, because I hadn't had the fan hooked up yet, it was reading, after 45 minutes, it was reading like 86.1 degrees. So, again, I don't know what the accuracy is of these thermostats. You know, I think it's plus or minus a, deg a degree or something like that. So this could mean 85 or 87. So I, I'm not sure. But I'll get more accurate thermostats. I just needed this as a baseline. So at 90 degrees after 45 minutes, 86, you know, I thought, well, yeah, that's not too shabby. Because uh, after about an hour or so, it, it ended up being like 87.3 or whatever. So it, it seemed like it was running about three degrees difference between the heat tape and the inside of the box here. But I want the insides of these boxes, obviously, depending on whether you want males or females or a mix, you're looking at anywhere from like 81-ish degrees to 89 degrees. You don't ever want to incubate over 90 degrees um, or you'll get hot females or hot um, – they're usually aggressive and they usually don't breed. So if I can dial in a temperature range of anywhere between 81 and 87-ish, 
you know, I'm good, good with that. Um, depending on the season, sometimes and the animals, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll temperature sex them for females, like the first clutch or two, and then I'll temperature sex them for males and then I'll do a mix. Um, it just depends on what your goal is or what your plans is plans are with the animals. Like if you're going to hold them back and not sell them, I, a lot of times will do a mix. I'll put that temperature right at 84, 85 degrees, whatever, 83, 84 to get a mix of male and females um, and just let them grow and then determine if they're males or females later. Um, with some of the darker animals, you know, like the black knights and that kind of stuff. Sometimes you want to incubate them at a lower temperature and you want to keep them uh, like within the first day or two or a week or whatever of them hatching at lower temperatures to keep the darkness in them, that kind of stuff. Uh, if you have bright animals and you want to get bright colors and patterns and you want to stay on the higher end of that range. Um, if you haven't read any of Ron Tremper's books, they're, they're really good as far as uh, the way he explains the, how temperature affects the color and that kind of stuff during incubation and after hatching. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. And even at, when they're adults, you know, if you have a temperature gradient on your rack or something um, from week to week, the animals could look a little bit different. So temperature is pretty an interesting thing with leopard geckos. So anyway, so it seemed to be holding temperature better than I thought as far as like, the, the the difference between the heat tape and the inside of the egg box. Um, so eventually, I get got probes again. This was when it was still at ninety five. Um, I have a egg box on the bottom shelf here, a box on the middle, and a box on top. Each one has the probe inside the box. And you can see the top shelf is like 88.3, the middle one's 89.9, the bottom's 89.6. So the middle one seems to be staying the warmest for whatever reason. Um, and I'll see if that holds true after a day or two of because uh, I have it set at 88 now and see if that holds true. If not, if it evens out uh, after leave, having the door closed for a day or so, um, then I'm not going to worry about it too much. But in some incubators, what you may have to do is like if you want – you know, your females or whatever you want, your lower temperatures, I'm going to have to, you may have to put them up on top. If you have multiple boxes going at the same time or multiple clutches, um, then, you know, kind of the warmer temperature incubation in the middle and the bottom here. So I'm going to, I'm going to mess with adjusting these shelf heights and that kind of stuff too. Um, and again, this was when it was like 95, the, when the probe was set at 95, and it was heating up and it was getting close to 90, 91 degrees kind of thing in the boxes. So we'll see what 88 does on the on the thermostat and see if that brings it down to like 85. And if that if that's the case, um, then I'll set it to like 85. And so, you know, get that 82-ish temperature range or whatever. Because I don't mind if they incubate a little bit longer, if they go 40 or 45, 55 days, whatever. Um, that doesn't bother me one way or the other. I know some people want, they, they want to go 30, 35 days, you know, kind of thing. They want them to hatch fast. I mean, and that's fine. It's just low. It's like cooking food, low and slow. I like low and slow or whatever it should be and whatever time it should be. Uh, let's see if I have anything else here, but all in all, I mean, it, for the money that I have into this thing, it came out pretty darn good. I mean, so, you know, I've got $80 into the actual wine cooler or the beverage cooler. Got about 50 bucks into the thermostat. Uh, the heat tape was like 345 350 a foot. And there, I bought four feet. So, you know, about 14 bucks for the heat tape ish, 15 bucks, whatever. Um, the fan was already in there, so I didn't need to spend money on that. I already had the 12 volt adapter. So really, I mean, it's, it's a pretty, pretty nice incubator for not, not too lot, not so much money. You know, it's, I think it's affordable for anybody. If you really had to, if you wanted a nicer than a styrofoam incubator and you wanted something, you know, 
that you can be proud of and have a number of egg boxes going at the same time. If you weren't like a huge breeder, it's a perfect setup. Like I'm not sure how many, cause I'm probably going to use 12 ounce deli cups. Um, so I'm not sure how many I'm going to be able to fit in there. And I also have to test if there's a temperature difference between the front of the incubator and the back of the incubator, if, cause if, if you're putting like multiple rows of egg boxes, like so if I have two or three deep, I want to make sure that the back egg box is reading the same as the front. And so it's just, it's going to take a little time and a little, you know, just a little messing around. I'm going to actually leave the fan running just to see how that affects the thermostats or the in, inside the egg boxes. And I may try it without the, the fan. I may just leave the fan off and see what happens. See if it leaves the temperature a little more evenly balanced throughout so it's just, it's experimentation and um, what your goals are, what your needs are, that kind of thing. Uh, right now, I don't need anything. You know, I'm not going to be hatching out hundreds of babies at one time. So, you know, I may have maybe 10 to 12, 16 at one time, whatever the case is, but which is not a lot. So that incubator is the perfect size for me at this moment. Um, if I need something bigger or if I need another one, I'll, I'll look into that. Um, but there are, if you do need a bigger one, you can apply this same principle to the taller, to the bigger beverage coolers. Like you, you see a ton of them on Facebook where people sell like old Coke coolers or old, you know, that was, was in a grocery store or something or whatever that are, you know, maybe a couple feet, three feet wide. And they're probably about five or six feet tall and have about eight, 10 racks in them. Um, same principle applies, except in those, I would almost um, run heat tape, the 12 inch heat tape on the sides. It depends on how the shelves go in there. Cause some of those commercial ones have like metal strips in them and the shelves like latch into those strips. So, and they're, and they're usually like wire shelves and there's usually a gap between the wall and the shelf. So you could run the heat tape down the side along the bottom and up the other side um, and possibly down the back and on the bottom. Uh, you really don't want to overlap the heat tape though. So but anyway, same, same principle applies. It's just, you want to start out with something decent that isn't put, you know, allow air to seep in and out, like has a good seal on the front door. Um, but outside of that, it's just, it's really simple. I mean, you can get a commercial one. I haven't really priced them lately. I just know that the nice ones are a thousand dollars plus and um, I don't need that right now. And I can't afford that right now, especially with all the geckos I bought recently. So I hope you got something from this. Um, I know I, I learned a little bit more than I did the last time and the process has been a little easier and a little smoother. And so I could probably pump these out a little, little quicker now than, you know, than previously when I was just messing around, not knowing what I was doing. Um, I do plan on having more content. Um, it's like I said, it's been a, a kind of a busy couple of weeks with uh, work and everything else and uh, just some family things going on. Um, so I'm going to try to get some stuff pre-done that I can just schedule and just so they can kind of release on their own in the background. I don't have to mess with them. Uh, but as breeding season starts kicking up here and things start moving along, I'll start popping in some more videos, some breeding videos and some, um, YouTube shorts and that kind of stuff. So thank you so much for watching and please share this. Please like it. Please comment. Uh, if you have any suggestions or you like it or you have your own uh, or whatever, if you have a, if you want to see certain content, just let me know. Uh, but going forward here, hopefully uh, be posting some things on a more regular basis. So yes. And I know my wife's going to say you repeat yourself and I know I repeat myself. So it's just, it's just my thing. I don't know why. Um, so have a wonderful day and Keep calm, her partner. See you soon.